They were the first lineage of Roman emperors after the fall of the Republic. Some of the most recognizable and better studied Roman emperors, and the story of their lives was really worthy of an HBO series. They were also the ones to reform Roman coinage, dismantling the old Republican system and establishing what numismatists call today Roman imperial coinage. They had a bit of everything, from some of the best emperors to ever reign, to some of the absolute worst. Let's take a quick look at some of the coins of the Julio-Claudians. Let's go! So, the Julio-Claudians reigned from 27 BC, with the institution of the Empire under Augustus, the first emperor, all the way to 68 AD, with the death of Nero. When we think about Rome as a political entity dominated by this figure of the emperor, who mixed elements of a monarchy, an enlightened aristocracy, and something akin to a very strong presidentialist system, these men were the ones who established and built the system, which would be the norm for the next 300 or so years. It is also at this time where we see with Augustus the reform of Roman money, which I discuss in detail in my Roman Imperial Denominations video. He establishes this really ingenious system with one gold coin for big trade and for savings, one silver coin for intermediate sized payments such as salaries and bigger purchases, and a series of smaller denominations and base metals, perfect for smaller purchases, which allowed the very urbanized Roman society to trade properly, with coins worth a quarter of a denarius, all the way to the minuscule quadrants, which would serve as small change, and in practical terms could buy you maybe some bread and some fruit. It was a very flexible and very adequate system for the times. I could make an entire channel dedicated just for the coinage of these guys. It really is vast and gorgeous. But today, let's skim the surface, look at one example of each emperor, and examine what is behind the iconography of each coin. As we will see, everything that you see on their coins had a reason to be there. And we start by the man himself, Augustus. He struck coins for over 40 years, and the designs are as diverse as they get. But one theme is repeated on his coinage, which is the reinforcing of the image of exceptionality of the emperor. It's this interesting balance between him trying to claim he was the first among equals, while also giving him near-divine status, really. So here what we have is one of the most common denarii ever struck by him, dated between 2 BC and 12 AD. By that time, Augustus was very well established and well into his old age. This is the image of a well established man. This example was struck in Lugdunum, in Gaul, one of the most important imperial mints after Rome, operating for around four centuries. Although Augustus was an older man by that time, the coin shows a rather <laughs> young looking Augustus. We never see him depicted as an old man, neither on sculpture nor on coins. This is obviously part of his propaganda machine. Augustus is not just a man, he's an entity, an idea. On the legends we can read, Caesar Augustus, Dewi Filius, so referring to his adoption by the now long deified Julius Caesar, Pater Patriae, father of his nation, an honorary title given to emperors once the Senate considered they had a fully established position. But Augustus himself knew that he was getting old, and the question of succession was in the air. His later coinage was aimed at easing the fears that might be brewing among the public about who would might succeed him. Here we have, we have Gaius and Lucius, sons of his friend and general Agrippa with his daughter, and they were the intended heirs to the throne. The legends tell a lot about Augustus' strategy of succession with the two boys. We read under the two figures, Gaius and Lucius Caesares, so Gaius and Lucius the Caesars, and in the overall legends around, Augusti Fili, Consul Designatio, Principi Juventutis, 
So the sons of the emperor, designated as future consuls, showing they were aimed at consular public positions, and princeps iuventutis, an honorary position aimed at Caesars. Just as the emperor was considered the princeps, the first among citizens, the princeps iuventutis was the first youth among the entire youth of Rome. Unfortunately for Augustus, his two boys would die prematurely. In fact, Augustus was incredibly unlucky with his succession. And as he died in the year 14 AD, it was laid upon Tiberius, his adoptive son, to take on the purple. Tiberius was somewhat scorned by Augustus, although he wasn't the worst candidate for the job. Known to be a diligent administrator and a great military commander at a young age, Tiberius had a bad rap on historical records due to his horrible relationship with the Senate. He wasn't very keen on politics, which led to his early retirement, and this gave way for even more slander to be thrown over the man. But in his 22 years as emperor, if we ignore the records and look at the facts, he did a good job. The policies on Augustus were maintained, the imperial budget was on a surplus due to his disciplined administration, and as far as the jobs of an emperor, as far as the work of an emperor is concerned, he did all right. As a result, quite a few of his coins have reached our days, which is a testimony to this good reign. So here's the denarius of him. This is the famously called tribute penny. Tiberius reigned during the lifetime of Christ, so it is attributed to him the passage where Jesus says, give upon Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. As we can see, the obverse of the coin prominently shows the bust of Tiberius with the laurel crown. On the legends, we can see he talks about his connection to Augustus, as we can read. Tiberius Caesar, Dewi Augustus Filius, so the son of the deified Augustus, emperor, and then Augustus, referring to himself, the next emperor. The reverse shows Pax, the goddess of peace, seated on a marvelously sculpted throne. I, I like the reverse of the, this particular coin more than the obverse. It's quite artistic and I like it. The figures show as Pax here, it's commonly said to be Livia, Tiberius's mother. The legends refer to Tiberius's position as Pontifex Maximus, so the chief priest of the Roman state religion. And from one good and one great emperors, we then move to one of the worst, Caligula. He started his reign extravagantly, throwing lavish festivals and exhausting the public treasury. But at first, nothing indicated he would be such a bad emperor. It is said that after a period of serious illness, right after assuming the title of emperor, however, he started behaving erratically, leading to what can be described as near insanity. His change was very swift and it can't be considered as something normal. He showed absolute disregard for, to people's lives, ordering executions arbitrarily, had a supposed incestuous relationship with his sisters, and let's not forget his proposition to elevate his own horse as a consul. Apparently, he didn't reach that level, but it is widely accepted that although his horse didn't get to be consul, he was successfully appointed as an official priest. The coinage of Caligula is rather uncommon nowadays because, obviously, after people got sick and tired of him and got rid of the maniac, he suffered a damnatio memoriae, a memory condemnation where all records of his existence were erased from the public sphere. And this included his coins, which, whenever possible, were withdrawn and reminted. The appearance of Damnatio Memoria in some of his surviving coins is actually rather common, with enormous gashes and slashes typically covering his coins, in a clear show of discontent and disrespect to his image. I'm putting on screen a couple of examples. Definitely, these are coins from people very angry at him. But for today, we're going to look at an untouched example. This is an ass, the workhorse of the Roman economy. This was the money of everyday transactions. This could pay you for lunch, for some basic groceries for the day, 
and for every silver denarius, you could get 16 of these pieces. This particular example was struck in the year 37 at the local mint of Rome. We can throw crap on Caligula all day long, but one thing we need to admit, this is a very pretty coin. I really like this coin, I don't know why. I mean, we have this massive bust of Caligula, very finely executed, dominating the design. The legends start with his imperial name, Caius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, we then have Pontifex Maximus and Tribunicia Potestas. On the reverse, we have a very benign reverse for such a crazy emperor. It's, it's almost paradoxical. We have Vesta, the goddess of home, family, everything that is homely and comfortable and nice. Such an ironic design for someone who was known for despising his entire family. But alas, imperial propaganda tended to hide these unsavory details. On the top of the goddess, we see the inscriptions stating which goddess it was, so Vesta, and by each side, and by each side of the goddess, we see the letters S, C. Very common on base metal coins. This meant Senato Consulto by decree of the Senate, a declara declaration that officially and by law, this base metal coin had to be accepted, and it was legal tender connecting it to the more valuable silver and gold coins by a ratio, which in this case was 16 asses per silver denarius, or 400 per aureus. From the ashes of the disastrous reign of Caligula came Claudius. Oh, how I like the story of Claudius's life. Snubbed by every previous emperor, considered a cripple incapable of public office and delegated to his scholarly pursuits, Claudius was to prove everyone wrong and become the best emperor since Augustus. Cultured, competent, smart with money, he would put the empire on a really good path. He was responsible for major infrastructure projects throughout the empire, the successful conquest of Britain, the rebalancing of the public budget after Caligula's excesses. He even approved the tolerance edict to some other religions throughout the empire. As long as these did not interfere with the normal operations of the state machine, they could profess whichever faith they wanted. So for him, we have another us. This piece is attributed to between the years 41 and 50 AD, so one of the most common issues under him. On the obverse, we see, similar to Caligula, this very dominant bust of him, occupying most of the flat. Given he doesn't look as attractive as Caligula, but hey, he did his job as an emperor much better, so I respect him more than Caligula. On the reverse, we see Libertas, the goddess of freedom and liberty. Definitely, the Romans must have felt much freer and at ease under Claudius than under Caligula. She is holding a pileus, the cap given to slaves once they were freed, so it was a common symbol associated to freedom by the Romans. The legends, Libertas Augusta, proclaims the freedom enjoyed by the people of Rome. The early imperial reverses are, are in my opinion, really good. The gods and goddesses have, are generally depicted with a lot of dynam dynamism and movement, and the fact that the ass has a, quite a big flan helps the dying gravers may add a lot of details to the sculptures. But unfortunately, due to his upbringing, poor Claudius was a bit of a pushover in many occasions. And when he married his fourth wife, Agrippina, she made him adopt, well, this guy, Nero. And we all know how that turned out. Nero's a funny one for numismatists. He was a bad emperor, he spent too much money, he spent it on personal projects instead of public works, he wasn't interested on practical matters, the great fire of Rome happened during his reign, and he even debased the denarius and reduced the weight of the aureus, some say to pay for the reconstruction efforts. Yet, his coinage is excellent in artistic quality. Pliny the Elder stated that Nero was a Skaeniki Imperatoris, or an actor emperor, as Nero was more involved on artistic pursuits than anything else, 
and this is reflected on his coinage, we see a very significant level of care put on most of his coinage. The portraits are generally very well made, and the reverses also have very well accompl accomplished art. During this time, we also have this interesting change in the way the emperor was portrayed. From Augustus up to Claudius, even if the coins were struck when the emperor was already old, the busts are always modeled with an idealized, always young portrait. Under Nero, we see a level of realism that must have come directly from his instructions. The realism is maintained even to his detriment, because as the years on his reign progress, he's depicted fatter and fatter. And since we have the image of this villainous, fat Nero from his later years as the typical image from him, that's what we have here, an aureus of his late reign. This example was struck in Rome between 64 and 65 AD, right around the time of the fire of Rome. This is such a historically significant coin. Notice the wear on this piece. I wonder if people noticed that these were lighter than previous Ori and decided to spend it instead of the earlier, heavier coins. On the obverse, we see the Laureus bus of Nero, with this very full face, you can barely make out his chin. And the legends read, Imperator Nero Caesar Augustus. On the reverse, we have this very authoritarian image of Jupiter sitting on his throne. But this is not a benevolent Jupiter. He is holding his scepter, showing he has the rule over all other gods. And on his right hand, right next to him, he has his feared thunderbolt, ready to strike down any opposition. The legends, Jupiter Custos, translates roughly to Jupiter the Guardian, Jupiter the Protector. With Nero's demise, the Julio-Claudian dynasty would come to an end. They were a family of extremes. Extremely good and extremely bad emperors. Fortunately, they all left us a pretty fantastic numismatic legacy to enjoy. Do you have any Julio-Claudians in your collection? Let us know in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. It really helps the channel. I hope you all have a great day. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.